This week on the Sports Initiative podcast, I sit down with theming expert David Sharkey. He discusses his transition from English teacher into theming consultant, how it can be used in sport, and why storytelling has so much power behind it, as well as real life examples in performance sport. As always, if you enjoy this podcast, please make sure you share it with friends and family. I hope you enjoy. Perfect. So, David, really appreciate you spending a bit of time with us today. How are things in your world? All good? Everything's great, yeah. No, happy to be on with you. Looking forward to 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 the chat. Should be good. Yeah, perfect. So, I think this is uh, should be an interesting one, um, I guess, for, for your end, a bit of experiential learning of what I'm used to and maybe what my experiences are, which will probably be different to, to what you're doing. Um, but also from my end, a really exciting topic which I think you know should resonate with a lot of coaches and hopefully myself I'm, I'm looking forward to learning quite a bit so I'm going to have a pen at the ready for this one so for no people worries. that maybe haven't come across your work do you just want to go across I guess a little bit about your background and then um what what space you're in at the moment sure so at the moment I am the director of a company called Team Architecture Limited and that is a communication consultancy which works with high-performing teams. I tend to work with groups or the leaders of groups, both mainly in sport, but also more recently in business, and trying to help them to align maybe their language, their key ideas, uh, and that's where the communication comes in. But I suppose the reason why people maybe have come across my work or might have known of me is that team architecture specializes in the use of themes and stories in order to kind of create team cohesion and hopefully to maximize performance. So that's, I suppose, in terms of my coaching and my uh, consultancy sort of capacity, working with, as I said, high performing teams. Um, my background is as a teacher. So I am an English, but a, an Irish English teacher, as I often say. I, I trained uh, over here in the UK uh, many years ago now, and I'm still here living in London. So I'm doing that part-time and team architecture is taking up the rest of my time or most of the rest of my time as well. So that's my sort of background, I suppose, uh, in terms of both theming and um, and my background in, in teaching. And of course, as an English teacher, I think they, there's great crossovers between those. So uh, it's nice to have something that sort of connects both worlds. Perfect. I think, yeah, that, that's quite a nice point for us to begin. So you mentioned that crossover point. I guess the first question for me is how how did you come about this realisation around the theme and work or the, you know, um, architecture and environment work, etc.? And, yeah, what, how did you come across it from the work that you were doing previously? So as an English teacher, who also teaches, I mean, I have taught history previously and an Irish person who's pretty interested in, in stories. It, when I look back now, uh, it seems it seems like it was always natural that I would end up in this space. Like I would work with people about how they use language and how they use stories or metaphors or ideas uh, in their environments or, or try to utilize them my, myself. So to kind of take, take you back a, a long time, I... A number of years ago, I was trying to refine aspects of my own practice as a, as a sports coach. I was working towards then my my level three in uh, in in uh, rugby coaching, and so I kind of had to build up a, a body of evidence and observe some people and see people in different sports and different environments. and And while that was all happening, I actually launched a project that I was interested in, which looked at the idea of uh, what I now call redefining masculinity or what I also call character coaching. So the idea was basically, could you teach and implement values and character with a group um, that would resonate with them? So could we have conversations that were often again, maybe done haphazard in schools, but could we have those maybe more consistent, consistently with people who, the students maybe knew, uh, had a relationship with, and me as a rugby coach, 
I was trying to have conversations about mental health and, me and emotional well-being and also for the uh, predominantly boys school that I was in I was also trying to give the boys uh, female role models that they could aspire uh, to to be like and all of that was uh, encompassed as I said in a project called redefining masculinity so I was doing that I was working in that space for a year I'd written up some of that some of those findings that I'd had and then the following year I came across theming which is what I now specialize in I came across that as a way to probably tie those things together better so rather than different stories that it necessarily connect there would be like a theme or an idea or a story that would tie all that together and so that's how I got into it first I was fascinated by it as a as an English teacher who deals in stories day to day and who gets uh, many eye rolls and groans from students when I maybe overanalyze a word or a phrase or suggest something could be something else that I think this space felt very very interesting and it was one that I've come to realize I think is un is is underutilized I don't think we maximize our language enough uh, in and I, I'm talking about from and I've worked with groups from you know underage uh, schoolboy schoolgirl kind of level all the way up to you know high performing teams um, you know who's who, who are very much so that the kind of pinnacle of their sport in many cases so I think in across those ranges we, we maybe underutilize how effective I think the right the right messages at the right time by the right people can be. So that's how I, that's how I kind of got, got into it a few years ago. Started writing up those experiences of theming, and now I run a company that specialises in that space. Perfect. So looking at it from a, um, I guess, a biological point of view or historical point of view, why does storytelling or yeah, why does storytelling resonate with people so much? Why does having an overarching belief system or overarching, um, you know, goal for the group, why does that resonate with people so much? And why is that important in group dynamics? So I, I, always, I always think of this idea when I, I, I think about this, but before... Before human beings could talk, we were we were scrawling images on caves and in the dirt to uh, uh, like elaborate something. We were we were telling stories in that space. So stories are older than language, are older than the spoken word. So before even we were able to do that, that's the kind of way in which we were communicating. And I think there's something quite powerful in that. And I think, well, why is that? Well. One, I think that stories stories can resonate with people. There's also again um, some work done that if you if you tell a story to someone, if it's about your own experience, you can also again have people who are either watching that uh, story like a movie, uh, a, a film, uh, something on TV, you know, someone telling, accounting a, something about their life. You can create those kind of same similar feelings in the other person. Uh, you can create that kind of connection and empathy between people. And it doesn't always have to be, let's say, a personal story, but it can engage us in a way that I think maybe, I don't know, raw data <laughs> can't. And I know there's maybe some data uh, people out there saying they could find perfect ways to tell stories uh, th th through data. But uh, I always think of that, that idea of, again, just how long we've been telling stories and actually just how long stories last can stay with us if you if you kind of touch the right buttons um, but I also think as well as a teacher and as a coach I think language and stories are a great way in which to explain something to to give it a I don't know a context or a, make it kind of last and I think that's something which I've said before is that I think a good story you or analogy or metaphor can prompt learning I think it can encourage that and, and maybe make something resonate and stick long after it's uh, the, the story has been told. So yeah, I think I think that's why people seem to um, and people people contact me regularly and um, 
in some cases they think I just do theming. I just sorry, <clears throat> I just do theming and, and kind of storytelling. Um, and the reason why is that that's the stuff I think that's most interesting or engaging for them. Um, when I tell them again that we could look at, you know, this could connect to, you know, your values and your on-field, off-field behaviors, or this could align to your supporter base, or uh, we could really look at your kind of long-term vision of the club and see something that might bring it to life. Um, they're sort of, they don't realize maybe the connections that I suppose I may be able to see of to how you can expand this. And the more I've explored this area, the more I see that people, I think, are using themes and using language in a certain way, but I don't think they're maximizing or, or utilizing it as effectively or as efficiently as they, as, as they could. That's not to say that necessarily I've maxed out on it, but I think we could be better at that. And so I think that's uh, the reason as an English teacher, as I said, it makes sense that maybe I'm in this space. So I think if we if we look towards that corporate world and corporate models, I think that is an interesting one and will probably uh, be applicable to a lot of people listening here. You, you hear and see a lot of companies that have strap lines underneath logos and then they'll say our five values are X, Y, Z. And then I, in my perception or what I hear is that at times that can get lost in translation. The further you away you get, you have those words on a wall. But then how do you actually live and breathe those values or those ideas? So I guess my question is initially, what when we're putting those things onto walls, what's the intention, I guess, from a corporation point of view of having those there? And then secondly, how can um, companies and CEOs and et cetera be better in the space of actually helping those resonate with the employees that are working on the ground on a day-to-day -day basis. It, there's a real, I, I can answer your question quite quickly when I say, why do companies put stuff on a wall? And honestly, it sounds or it looks good. That's the quickest way I can tell you that, but it really doesn't have much resonance. It was designed and dreamed up by people who aren't necessarily on the ground in many cases. And sorry, that's a, that's a cynical view of, uh, of the experiences maybe that I've seen um, and had understandings of. Um, I think there's a day, I remember as a coach uh, years ago, as it, sorry, as a teacher who coaches, I remember I laminated a, le a session plan and it was this, it was the worst, it was the, <laughs> it was such a waste of, <laughs> of a laminating pouch because by the time I'd laminated, and got down to the pitch. I'd already changed the session, but I'd laminated, so I couldn't I couldn't write on it or change the sheet of paper. I was like, well, this was this is actually not right anymore. And I think that's the same when we we paint something on a wall or we write something up. Is that it looks good, but it doesn't actually. I think it it's not cognizant of the fact that language evolves and adapts. Language changes, and people forget that. I think, but we can agree as a group of people or as individuals, we can agree on what terms mean. Um, we could, we could meet somewhere else, uh, you know, in the, you know, somewhere else in the country and the phrases and language and terms we use won't make sense to them. Um, and the same is true in sport and the same is true in business. The same is true with any group that there are certain, there's certain um, shorthand and phrases and tone and all those things again change. So I think that as soon as you, in my case, laminate something or you write something open a wall, I hope it lasts. <laughs> but I think it's not aware enough of the fact that, geez, we might need to change that in a few months' time or a year's time. It, that mightn't quite capture what, what it is we're trying to do. So that's my first kind of, uh, I suppose, uh, comment on that. And I think. I think um, the more we reflect on that and take stock of the adaptability of language, the malleability of language, and like we could, even as a group of, uh, you know, of coaches or a group of, you know, a leadership team, the sports group, or, a, you know, as I did quite recently with an Irish banker, kind of senior marketing team, I could put forward, you know, uh, you know, having listened to them and spoken to them, we could put forward certain ideas. And to one person, that group, that word might mean something or have a certain baggage that we didn't necessarily mean it to be. So sometimes it's just redefining those things and establishing what they mean to us can be probably a lot more useful if it's a 
a language we've agreed upon we're going to use from day to day. Um, and if we've gone through that process, then I suppose we could put it up on the wall. But as I said, we might need to revisit in a couple of months or a year's time and then change what's on the wall <laughs> or not laminate stuff as you know, as, as the case of me. So um, that would be my sense on, on, on those things is that don't forget that language is a, it can change. Uh, it should change. It will change. You know, the, the way in which we're interacting and speaking now is different to the way we spoke, you know, years and years ago. So uh, it, it's definitely, we need to see it more like that, I think. No, I think that's a really interesting point um, in terms of that, that change in meanings and how words can reflect certain periods of time. I guess a reflection on that is then how do um, leaders of companies help direct the ship of, of, you know, if they've got, you know, 200 people, let's go a smallish scale, if you want to call it that, you're a company and you have 200 people that, you know, work within your company. How do you assign what you want the people in your company to look like in terms of uh, the type of people they are or the way that they go about their business? How do we do that in a more, I guess, efficient and one malleable way from what you're saying there? Because again, what we say now might change in six months, might change in a year. So how can we how can we do that in a way so that we're constantly being able to adapt to whatever the circumstances are? I think in in that space the the I I work with groups, but I tend to work with groups and the leader of those groups. I tend to work with head coaches or people close to the top of that coaching tree, or people in a business corporation again who are close to the top. Now I'm doing that partially because they can influence down quite well. They can, and getting their thoughts clear as to what it is they're trying to do and achieve, that then, and then the best way in which to translate that to the group, I think is important. Now, that can happen simply for the the vision that they have for the, the group that they're with and what where they see them going. And just even clarifying that can be actually quite powerful because sometimes again people people one thing i always discover is that people when they talk about like a team like a group of people i always kind of go what's the what are the teams within the team like give me a map of all the different dynamics of how this how this works and if i hand it to someone at the top of the organization would it be the same as if i handed someone at the bottom would they put people in different places because they tend to they're not looking at the thing the same. And so sometimes actually just sharing our model of how we see each other is quite powerful and effective and brings us closer together, can create real connection and collaboration. Um, so sharing that vision and letting people, sometimes it can be a, a leader sharing their vision of how they see you or this group or what we can achieve together and people buying into that or listening to people, what, listen, this is what I think the vision is. What do you think? I have a vision that in five years we can do X. Someone's going, oh, I thought we were going to do Y. All right, cool. Talk to us about Y. And we might maybe come to some sort of agreement as to why Y won't work or X won't work or, geez, we could do X and Y. Um, so I think the more, the more uh, kind of helpful dialogue that you can have both up and down a hierarchy uh, and across, I think the better. And and looking at your group in that way, I think can be quite effective. And I think that's one of the reasons why. And it sounds strange. Like there'll be people listening to this podcast going, "This guy's a part time English teacher. Like what the hell does he know about the corporate space or what's he know about high performance?" Um, and sometimes I think having an outsider come in and just ask these questions can be quite effective. Um, and I think that's why they. I, I have a, a list of clients that are. Uh, happy to endorse me or happy to kind of keep me um, around in, in different ways, not always to to help them. Maybe it's to help them at the start when they're trying to create that connection or establish their vision or, um, you know, create a story that might maybe resonate with, with their group. Or maybe it's just a, you know, a, a call every couple of months or maybe it's specifically we need to do this for this event or this, you know, it might be working with a group on a campaign, on a cup campaign, um, you know, in their in their sports environment, whatever it might be. But uh, 
Yeah, I think sometimes, again, having someone outside, a naive expert, um, <laughs> ask maybe some questions like that, again, could be could be quite useful. Yeah, I, I like the point you said there around the team within the team, because I think we're all fully aware of it. If you know when you work in that space, you know what the little clicks are and you know that how they might affect. And talking to your real life experiences, it's no different to a classroom, which section of classrooms get on really well, which don't. And I imagine you know you as a teacher have probably experienced that multitude in terms of mm-hmm. how if you get everyone pointing in the same direction, like you mm-hmm. as a class can create a fantastic environment. But equally, if you get that wrong and you get friction within a classroom of however many kids out, that can then derail. So I think that whilst what you're saying there regarding having, being an outsider, there's actually real relatable skills that you're bringing to the table that ultimately you're just working with big kids, right? That's essentially what all of us are. And you know, you've got some skills there that you'll be able to relate, which I think is, uh, yeah, really fascinating. Um, in terms of the theme in space, then, can you kind of give us a definition of what what it is, what it looks like, and I guess how it's utilised within a sporting context? So, theming is, uh, as I said, an area that I've I've, I've come to specialise in uh, within the, the 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 realm of communication consultancy. And I would define theming, and I always say this, this is a definition. Um, there are others possibly that can define it other ways. And I would say that theming is the use of an idea, a word, a phrase, a motto, a mantra, an extended metaphor or storyline that is designed to illustrate, engage, motivate, prompt learning for an individual or a group of people over time. Now, there's a lot in that. Now, ultimately, I suppose, there is a purpose to theming, and there are different scales which I can get into, uh, as I see it, that you could use theming in a very specific technical sense because you want your your defense to perform something specific like how they tackle or how they engage an opponent or how a tennis player might serve or or anything like that it could be a very very specific kind of moment there or it could be an extended thing where actually it's both on pitch and off pitch they become the routines and the rituals that we engage in there are physical reminders of it there might even be stuff written up on the wall that links to it or pictures of it or whatever it might be but it's that idea of kind of blending something through your environment or what it is you're trying to do for an individual or for a group that's ultimately what it's doing and it's trying to maybe bring something to life that might be difficult to understand or it might be a way to motivate as i said a group of people this is the challenge we're facing and it's kind of like this and sometimes seeing those parallels sometimes can be a novel way to engage a sporting uh, organization So if you think about professional athletes, and I've the privilege of working with some in in the in the different environments in which I work, and if you think of let's take football for example, if you're a kid in football who's come through an academy system, how many meetings have you sat in? How many coaches have you had? How many presentations have you watched? How many video clips have been sent to you? How many ways we diced up the game for you as best as we can to try and show you something? So in many cases, what I'm saying is that, is there a novel way to maybe engage these people? Because you could make them switch off. And I'm a, as I said, I'm a part-time English teacher who's had plenty of people switch off. I can see it in front of my eyes. They're like, they're not there. They're not in the room. They're too tired. Uh, I'm boring them. You know, I've, I've, I've lost them. But I need to get them to a certain point. So it's the same, I think, in in a sports environment where you could package something in a fairly engaging way saying, hey, our story's like this. We're like, I don't know, we're like Project Apollo. We're trying to go to the moon. It's like, what? <laughs> you know, we're a football team. We're, you know, we're a rugby team. We're, you know, I'm a tennis player. I'm a swimmer. I mean, what the hell have I got to do with Neil Armstrong? Okay, well, let's see. <laughs> and see if we can dig into it. Now, another thing is that I think, I think it can be engaging for people. And I think the danger I see is that some people use it as a gimmick 
<laughs> where it's maybe just about engagement um and it can maybe lose resonance because people are like oh come on this isn't this isn't what we're trying to do this isn't again who we are and i think when you lose that that's when you should definitely stop it but sorry i've gone off a bit of a rant there about what theming is but as i said i uh I spend a lot of time talking about it so uh apologies feel free to stop me at any stage <laughs> no 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 as i always say it's far better to have people listening to the, the guests than it is listening to me talk nonsense so uh, they'd much prefer that um so yeah I, I guess my question off the back of that could you give an example of i guess in, in a performance context yeah how you might go around theme in certain areas so if we take it from a defensive point of view um you know what what type of themes could we draw out is have you had experience of you know this is our overriding banner of what we want to be and here's some strands we're going to work on that feed into that yeah just so we could i guess in my head so i can visualize of what it might look like so there are there's a whole range of ways you could use theming down to the micro level of uh what nick winkerman would call queuing um so specific uh, cues, specific kind of prompts for an athlete to perform a movement or to achieve a, a movement solution to a certain problem to execute a skill in some cases all the way up to kind of whole group on pitch off stuff sort of theming long lasting so there's different scales as I said uh, of that so the, the example you picked up defense there you always want to think what is it exactly that we want to achieve so um if you're a defense, what is it ultimately? What's the what's the outcome you're hoping for? Um, some people might say it's to, well, if it's in football, it's to, well, stop shots on goal. Um, it's to prevent goals, you know, happening. It's to, but then other people might say, actually, no, let's get the ball back. It's to create the attack. It's the initiation of those. Now, it could be all those things if you want. So, what kind of what story if that's our starting point of what it is we want to achieve and who are the people we want to work with well then a theme simply could be a story that might connect to that or an idea so it could be that i've seen people like in rugby for example i've seen people uh and actually sorry uh, i've seen this more recently with uh, uh all or nothing with michael arteta michael arteta is definitely he's exploring the area of theming um, but I think he's doing it in a motivational pre kind of match sense, which is fine. It can definitely be used in that space. And I've worked with people and designed stuff and delivered stuff in that space myself. It can go further than that. But sorry, the image again that he had was like a pack of wolves. And I know Saracens, for example, uh, in rugby use like the wolf pack as a kind of sense for their, their kind of team ethos, but I think specifically also for their, for their defensive principles that might link to certain ideas. And that idea then they were able to layer in, I suppose, principles of what it is we want to do as a defense, uh, what it is we want to achieve, and then maybe some of the technical movements that could also, again, build into that theme. So that could be a, a very simple way in which to, to utilize that. Um, another example, which I've spoken about before is, um, and I don't see this in football as much, it's become more of a thing in rugby, <laughs> where people uh, you might team your bench the people who don't start so in rugby and i've groaned and i'll know people will groan listening to this is that <laughs> there there's some people that call uh, the bench not the bench or substitutes but finishers okay yeah, it's okay. like well you're just trying to sell me you know something that i really don't care about or you know i don't want i'm not interested in that you're saying i'm a finisher now um that that would be an example of uh, now you could argue that if people do that properly and really explain now listen your job is really in the last in the second half or in the last 20 minutes we need you to do this it's a very very specific role i don't think that's something you can do from the start for x y and z reasons or because of the personnel we have here or who we're playing and you could argue that would be a a way in which that would be effective um the best one i've heard is the south african um rugby team their bench is called the, the bomb squad uh, and that's a <laughs> that's a that's a very clear idea of now again when you see these physical beings these specimens <laughs> you get a sense of why they're called the bomb squad uh, and what their job is to do and you could argue that that gave them a very very clear role and that's where i think theming can doesn't have to but it can be psychological periodization it can be priming people for self-talk 
you know, when they're in the middle of play or they're getting themselves ready for play. Or it could be just an idea that sort of resonates and stick with them to remind them of the principles that we want to uh, evoke here. If you're the bomb squad, then, <laughs> you know, your job is to blast rocks and to, you know, smash guys in tackles and to carry the ball hard and make yards. And, you know, that's exactly what South Africa wants to do. And they were pretty successful with it by winning the World Cup uh, and how they bullied England in that uh, 20, uh, 2019 final. So there's some examples of maybe how you could use themes uh, in those sorts of spaces. But as I said, there's different scales and there are different people, as I said, using them in different ways. And whenever I speak to people, sometimes they want the big theming on all fields, behaviors, uh, routines, rituals, totems, all that kind of stuff. Uh, that can be the real cool end of theming. But if you're working with a group that isn't necessarily used to that, then I think going to that deep end first can actually be quite damaging because it's uh, it's too much too fast. So building up to those things, I think, could be useful. Sometimes finding a part of your game uh tactically that you want to develop like you're counter-attacking um you're pressing uh whatever it might be like we use metaphors again in sports all of the time we use again analogies that sort of clarifies those things i suppose theming is just expanding maybe on some of those analogies and metaphors that you could use no perfect i think the bottom squad one is a really interesting one you use there because it also changes to a degree the narrative for the the fans and the players when they're coming on because I, I was actually at the England-South Africa game, I think it was September last year, maybe, um, or, or whatever it was. And you could feel in the stadium when those guys stand up a sense of anticipation. Mm. And for those players, it must be a sense of going, oh, coming off the bench. So actually, let me know, this 60,000 people I have an expectation of what I need to do and how I impact the game here. Mm. And I have to live up to that and I want to live up to that. So almost that narrative that it changes from a, you know, from a point of view of a player, you almost feel more valued because there's value that's being placed on the, the name and the story around it, I guess, which is, yeah, I think a really fascinating psychological difference it might be for the players there. The to jump back to something we spoke about earlier about language being flexible and adaptable and malleable is that like theming I think at its best or language that is aligned at its best is a chance for us to redefine and reassess what we mean by these words and I think that's quite important so they just redefine what the bench meant what the substitutes meant they redefine their roles and thought well actually like if, if we go back to the learning analogy, they found the teams within the team, didn't they? They found that actually there's a team of people on the who are not on the pitch who are important. And everyone will talk about the 16th man in, 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 in rugby or the 12th man in football or this is part of a bigger squad. But that might be lip service in many cases, whereas they actually kind of found a way, actually, your role is this and this is why you're important. And I think actually the people that can connect up those teams together and unite them and redefine language in some cases and prime them psychologically for the, the 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 task they need to undertake to achieve goals. I think those are the most effective groups because it's not just that they're like language can connect you. Because I always say this again, is that we can talk about like we can talk about language that includes. So if you speak our language, if you understand what bomb squad means, if that was, let's say, a private thing within the Springbok uh, South African rugby camp, or if you were the Wolfpack, uh, or if you were Arteta talking about um, Thomas Edison and light bulbs, I don't know. Sorry, have you seen uh, All or Nothing? Do you know what I'm referring to? I, I have. A, well, I've seen clips of it. I'll be honest, I'm a Tottenham fan, so I've stayed clear to it as much as possible. I see. But no, but... I do know what you're on about because I have seen a lot of people message and tweet and, and yeah. whatnot. So yeah, I know exactly what you're on about. Sorry. So ultimately, I suppose it's um, he's using, again, certain ways in which like to redefine like the challenge that they're facing that day. And I think, again, the most effective groups do that well and they find ways to make something like I remember it was uh, like Phil Jackson, again, the basketball coach of the Chicago Bulls and, and L.A. Lakers. He was someone who used theming and lots of people talk about the last dance as a theme. Now it is. But it's a very thin one. Do you get me? Like, if it's the last time you're a group together, that is a theme. 
that is something that runs throughout. So every time you come to practice, or every time you you go to LA, this could be the last time this group goes to LA and plays the Lakers in the in the regular season, or this is the last time we're going to the playoffs. It's the last time we're going to win, uh, you know, this conference or the NBA championship or all those kind of things. So you can go back to it, of course, but you can you could develop it further if you wanted. But sorry. He would talk about the sense that the best players love the grind. They don't get bored of the stuff you have to do again and again. Now, that's really hard to do. And not everyone's built like that. And I think theming, and I think the example of Arteta is that he finds a way to make the grind, make the stuff we have to do again and again and again. He finds a way to make it novel, and fresh, and stick with them. It's... It's it's the same message you told last week, but it's kind of told in a new way, and it maybe sticks that a little bit more. It kind of stands out, um, and again, that can be that can be really really effective uh, at getting people up for the same challenge. And as someone who's worked in a league that is, you know, um, about thirty six weeks of the year um, in the top fourteen in France. I can tell, I could, I could I testify. And the thing is that, like, I'm doing it via distance. So I'm like, I'm communicating, you know, via Zoom calls and WhatsApp messages and, and, and whatnot. And I try and get out to France again as much as I can. But even for me, it's, it's you know, we've got another challenge. Like, I can only imagine what it's like for the lads in the dressing room. Uh, and I, when I chat to them, that is something, again, that, you know, they, they, they find difficult. But of course they do, because they're human. Um, and that, as much as we want to, you know, glorify the grind, it is the grind <laughs> in it's many ways. For a reason, right? Exactly, exactly. So I guess the next question is, I think the understanding around having those those narratives or metaphors or almost visuals, like the Wolfpack one is one that I've used previously, I think is a really nice one for defensive mm. action. It's just like if your first one goes, he might not get it, but your Wolfpack's there to back you up. And if we yeah. go in two and threes or fours, we're better as a pack than we are as a, as a lone wolf. Um, so I think that's a really nice, uh, easy one that people can use. Looking at it from an, I guess, an overarching thing, if, if you've become skillful in that area where you can utilise those little narratives, little stories, little, um, yeah, little conversations, etc., how do we then put in place, I guess, that wider scaffold that might take you over a 36 week season what, mm. what does that look like and what yeah i guess what examples have you got of something as a wider ranging principle or wider ranging theme and then little strands that can, can come up can come off of that at different points within the season so you need a lot of flexibility and adaptability because the challenge is changing all the time and you need a you need a story that you know well enough that you can dig down into, but can adapt to whatever the challenges you have. And in the example of working across a season that's, um, you know, 36 weeks, uh, you, you probably, you probably uh, utilize someone like me uh, and have someone in that space that's sort of helping you with that because, and that's certainly the way the dynamic has worked out. And sorry, just to jump back, one group that are quite skilled in this area of using themes would be the Canterbury Crusaders in New Zealand. And they have a culture of that that goes back to, as far as I can establish, uh, Wayne Smith in the mid to late 90s. Um, so they've been doing this for a long, long time. And because of that, they're able to then to, to utilize it in a, in a real deep and sense. And the thing I've always said is that, and I got the, I got to I, I get to experience this when I work in different spaces. Is that, you know, Super Rugby season is quite short and sharp in many cases. Uh, a French Rugby season goes from the end of August through to, if you're in the finals, um, which Stade Rochelet were uh, sorry two years ago, and then um, got to the playoff the knockouts then uh, last year. You, you run through to June, so you know, it's. Sorry, it's longer than thirty-six weeks, isn't it? Though that's a that's far longer. Um, so that's a so in, in, I suppose comparing those is that you could have a shorter theme, but maybe the other one you maybe you, you dial up or dial down as much as you need. Uh, you go to it when you have to. Uh, might be some of the advice, or which is an area again which I I suppose I I work with is that uh, you theme and then you've got sub themes that connect to that, uh, and you find ways in which to tell that story in a unique way. And you know. 
your, your question about you know what story people might might resonate with people uh, and i get this a lot where people will come to me and say cool we are this group of people what story should we pick and i always go i don't have a clue like i don't i have no idea um i think it's important we try to find that out but i'm conscious of the fact of stories i've viewed previously might work for you um and people i think make that assumption quite a bit i think we tend to we tend to maybe see someone who's done something else and go, oh, that story's cool. I'll use the same. Um, now, it might work. It might. But I think if you're willing to push yourself and you're able to think a little bit differently and think carefully what it is you want to achieve, you might find a story that's far more powerful and no one's doing. Um, I always say this about the, the rugby club that I'm involved with here in London, the HAC, the greatest rugby club in the world, as they call themselves. Uh, <laughs> and... You know, for two years, we implemented an Ayrton Senna theme. Now, if anyone's out there doing an Ayrton Senna theme, I'd love to meet them, but I doubt there is. Uh, and if they are, good luck to them, but they're probably not doing it how we're doing it. And that's okay. That's fine. Um, and finding those unique ways that make no one else in, no one else is doing this. No one else is, is using these, you know, reminders, physical reminders of the environment, or no one else is doing man of the match like this, or no one else is using this language. That's cool, because that is language that includes, but also excludes, because this is who we are, and you are someone else. And that's okay, that's fine. Um, but you don't know what Senna means. You don't know what those 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 terms mean. I think that can be quite, quite effective. So with a big group, it is, or with a long season, you got to know your story really, really well. And I've had conversations with coaches who are theming, and <laughs> they've said, they told me what their theme is. And I said, oh, cool. Have you done this? Like, no. I'm like, have you done this? No. I was like, do you know who this is? They're like, no. I was like, you need to know your theme better. Like, <laughs> I'm not doing your theme and I know it better. Like, um, so I think, I think, yeah, knowing your story really well and how it might click and work with your group is really, really important. Because if it doesn't work for your group, the people are looking at you going, why is he talking about Mount Everest? Why is he talking about um apollo why is he talking about Ayrton senna <laughs> then you got a problem like uh and as i said i know lots of people were looking at arteta like that as well um <laughs> in some cases but hey they're they're doing all right much to your annoyance yeah listen they're doing good they're doing good work <laughs> and they're playing good football so i can't hate them as much as i'd like to but mm. yeah i think uh, i guess what's resonating with me there and i'm just thinking particularly in an academy space is could you utilize the theme of a player's journey potentially? Like, you know, if, if Saracens, for example, and Owen Farrell, who's come through their, their academies or Toje or something, and actually really link that into, you know, different aspects of their journey, different challenges they had. This is the, you know, Tuesday night away at sale day. This is, mm. you know, it was wet and windy. They managed mm. to get themselves out of this environment with a whim through 32% possession of that day where they did this, that is today the, the odds that we're up against. But we can and do it and then fill in the blanks around that. I'm just thinking in a football context, I can imagine that working nicely with, you know, there's academy graduates that go, mm -hmm. have gone on to do incredible things. Can you, one, embed, you know, reinforce messages that there is opportunities for those of you that are, are fortunate but also you highlight challenges that they've gone through that mm. the kids might be able to resonate with because they have been to Chelsea away or they've got Man United and the FA Youth Cup or whatever that may be I don't know if I'm yeah. shooting completely in the wrong direction there please shoot me down if I am no no no, no. far from it and I think if we like I got into theme because I was interested in character coaching in rather than wait to the end of a season or have an experience and look back and go, what did we learn? And I'm not saying that's fine. It's okay to do that. And that's important to reflect. But rather than wait to see what we might face, can we not think about in advance? Like what characteristics do we want these people to have? Like what is the success criteria for this group? Who do we want them to be on and off the pitch? And again, whenever we go to that in a sporting academy environment, or a sports environment, we'll always talk about technical and tactical skills, maybe even psychological skills under pressure. Maybe you might get that. But you might necessarily get like aspects of their character, that they might carry themselves well, that they might be better people, that they might have be able to express themselves. Like that's not something that seems to be that important to academies. <laughs> but I think it's important to 
it was important to me as a as a, as a teacher as someone who cared about them but you care about people like that i don't know you want to develop them in that way and that's where i got into theme i got into theming because that's so <laughs> whenever i speak to people and they're working in, in in the high performance space is that a lot of things are about we got to win and i get that like they want to win they're competitive and there's money on the <laughs> there's money on the line in the sense of people's jobs are at stake and performance and those kind of things those are important but also you can develop people's character you know you can bring a group together and reveal something about yourself and um, so no that example i think you, you you picked of modeling actually someone who's been through that could be fine that could be a theme and people think it needs to be a story it needs to be a b c d like it doesn't have to be um more recently this summer i worked with um i worked in my home county back in ireland um in gaa gaelic uh, gaelic football and uh we decided that their team was going to be focused on courage we thought from speaking to the players speaking to the management having done some work with them we felt courage is what they needed now when we think of courage we tend to jump to the big courage we tend to jump to the big moments the the free kick you know, uh, to win the match or level the game or the tackle, or we think of that. But for us, courage, it meant that, but it meant a whole lot of other things that we needed to get to, that we actually needed to add to their game. Now, sorry, not add to their game, because as I kept repeating, Jack Cooney was the, was the manager at the time, and I kept saying to him that it's not that you're saying, you're, you're not trying to make them courageous. You're showing them that they already are, like, because they are. And when we broke that down as to how people were courageous, like some of those lads in that group were courageous because of some of the mental um, health struggles that they went through in terms of addiction. Like there's a there's one of the guys in that team, again, who been through hell and he's back playing and he's back competing and he's back performing and he's back in a group sober for God knows how long. Like it's not kicking a free, it's not a tackle, but it's courage. So it's finding a different way in which to package those things. And so we use courage as the as the core theme, and that was going to be part of our language. And then we use the story of Katie Taylor, the Irish, the probably the greatest Irish boxer of all time. And um, we used her story as a way to encapsulate that courage. So where was she courageous? Where was she courageous in the ways that we need to be courageous? What parts of her story linked to our story? And then over their campaign last uh, over the summer, we were able to bring to life the stuff we wanted to do in a novel way to allow them to perform, to come together. And as I said, like if <laughs> if someone else is out there doing the Katie Taylor theme, I'd love to meet them. Um, are they bold and Irish too, like an English teacher? <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. Like have I met my double somewhere uh, who's doing something like this? But like. That was a unique experience for them who'd been in this high performance environment for many, some of them for many years. And it was the same old, we've got to do X, Y, and Z. And this was a novel way to capture something they were doing anyway um, and allowed them to, to be successful. Yeah, I think as you're talking now, I'm thinking there's probably some work that can be done on the curriculum base to add you know, those skills into curriculums for kids, particularly in academy. We do talk about tech, tap. There's, mm. there's a logical psychological ball, but actually can we within that add in those those skills that we're talking about courage you know resilience and at some point do we actually place a focus on that and how, what does that look like as you mentioned courageous might be getting up and talking in front of your team because you hate yeah. it you hate doing the thing and a 30 yeah. second presentation might be as courageous as someone else going up mount everest because for yeah. them heights don't matter but it's understanding that we've all got our challenges and limitation in that but we all show courageousness throughout our days and you know how, how does that resonate with everyone in the group and we know as a group if we applaud those little actions that everyone does that actually will lead us to bigger actions at the back end of it um so yeah, definitely, definitely some food for thought for me to go away with. I'm conscious that we're at the time we kind of allotted for this. So um, this might be a, a challenging question, but who is the best practitioner you've worked with in this space and why? Sorry, do you mean in terms of using themes or so using themes or creating a you know cohesive group something within that architecture in a, a team that is aligned i guess 
I think I think lots of the people who I work with and I think there's a reason I work with them and they keep me on is that they're open to different ideas. They're open to be questioned and challenged. Um, so I mentioned Jack Cooney there in the GAA is a really good example of someone who is just curious and is exploring something different and who found something between me, him and the group that really landed and worked. So it's not so much that he is the best person at theming, but he is open to it. I think that that, that there's a big difference about that. Uh, and I think Ronan O'Gara, as I said, with Stad Rochelet in the, in the top 14, he is someone who is um, taking a different career path um, that lots of ex-players. So he went straight from playing into coaching, which is always particularly challenging and dangerous, you know, uh, as I've often said. There are lots of, and there's, listen, football is probably, is probably more prevalent in the sense of um, footballers thinking they can coach and they can't because just because you're a good jockey doesn't mean you're a good horse. Like, you know, it's it's vastly different. And so Ron Agar, when he finished his career in 2013, went straight into a coaching role, in the backroom staff in another country, in France. So went to um, Racing 92 in the backroom staff there and learned his trade there quietly in a different language um, and then he went to the Crusaders and saw what theming was like under Razor Robertson uh, in New Zealand uh, for two years and then came back and took the, the head job at La Rochelle and saw some of the stuff I'd written and reached out and said like he's a Hall of Fame rugby player he's coaching one of the best sides in Europe and he asked an English teacher <laughs> if he would desire to think, do you get me? Like it, it all sounds quite bizarre, but these are people who are, I don't know, they recognize there's something that could be of use to them. So it's not so much that those are, they, they are open minded. They're curious. And as I said, I see that in, I certainly see that in Miguel Arteta. I see that in uh, Pep Guardiola. I see again, how they, how they talk, how they interact. I see that in Klopp. Mentality monsters, I would argue is partially theming. He's reframing a psychological state he wants his players to be in. He's connect like, you know, these people are, are, are advocates of it, not just because they're able to do it in and of themselves, but because they're willing to be challenged and listen and uh, take on board a new way to package something. Like anyone who's coached for, you know, in the professional space or has been in the professional space will know just how long and intense it can be. And lonely it can be so listening to others and taking other ideas on board i think could be a real benefit and i think as i said you know jack cooney and Gar are proponents of that because they're creatively they're imaginative they can see how this can can link and listen it's not for everyone and everyone people are going to be a bit more like oh come on this is nonsense like this is you know why are we talking about this story we need to be doing and that's like that's okay it's not to say like this is the only way but as I said, the best people I've seen are open-minded or imaginative, can see the flexibility of how we can redefine language and bring a group together uh, in the most effective way to make them perform, to build their character, to create memories. Like, that's the exciting thing for me, uh, being in this space. Now, as I say at the end of these conversations, I'm always more interested in the why than the who, because I think the why gives a really nice insight into, I guess, what you value in, in the people that you work with or come across and i think from what's resonated with me there is people that are willing to challenge the norm and are open-minded to something different which yeah i think is, is a really good rationale for why you know they're, they're good practitioners because you know the, the more open-minded you are you'll hopefully learn something from someone but i, th I think um as i said the people you know the people i've mentioned there i've, I've been contacted from people you know, all around the world in different sports. And there's always that curiosity. And, you know, I've had other people who've been curious, who brought people on a call who are far more skeptical. And that's okay. That's fine. They should have a healthy skepticism. What, the, what will this look like in my environment? How is this relevant to me? It's a good question to ask. And I think maybe we should ask it more often. Um, but being contacted by people who are involved in Olympic sport, who, you know, is, is, is looking to take, uh, you know, his country to, uh, the Olympics in France in in Paris in in uh, 2024 and 
you know, just sounding me out, just asking about it and exploring it. And he'd actually been, he, you know, he'd seen it, what it looked like in certain spaces. And he was just wondering what it looked like for me and whether I'd come on board and maybe support him with it. Uh, and this is someone who's very successful in his own right. And just being open to that. I think that's, those are the people that it's really encouraging to work with. You know, a few weeks ago, I gave a talk to the Australian Institute of Sport. Uh, and there was a group of coaches. There was someone, and again, I've never met an Alpine ski coach. And she was asking me about like how this could work from an individual level. And that for me was a great challenge. Like, I'm, geez, you catch me at the top of the mountain, we're in trouble. Like, uh, <laughs> there she is working, you know, how can we make this? And, and, and I could, you know, we could explore things and she could take things that will work for her. And I think, as I said, that's maybe the benefit of having an outsider come in and just ask some of these questions and put something in front of them that finds, you know, as I always say, uh, people get annoyed with me saying it uh, time and time again, find a story that you belong to. And when I say story, that could mean theme, but it could be what is your story? Like what it is you're trying to, you know, achieve? What it is you're trying to do? Who are you trying to bring together? Um, and I think if you find that, and the best people I've worked with have been open to finding that story, have been willing to adapt and change it if needs be, but they're bringing groups together. And that's why I said my, my, my company is called Team Architecture. It's about that. It's about bringing groups together to achieve something, be it even groups of people around an individual athlete or a corporate environment or whatever it might be. But it's it's trying to create that connection between people. Perfect. Listen, David, a great conversation for people that um, maybe want to investigate your work a little bit more or want to see you online. Where can they find you before we finish up? Sure. So uh, they can find me, I suppose, if you Google Team Architecture Limited. Um, I'm on Twitter. Uh, Shark Teams, at Shark Teams, is my, uh, is my Twitter handle. I'm on Instagram. I can't remember what it is, but I'm sure if you look at Team Architecture, you'd figure it out. I really don't get my head around uh, that, let alone, Jesus, I mean, someone suggested starting a TikTok, and that was just a bit too much for me. Uh, but yeah, I have a website as well, uh, team, www.team-architecture.com. Um, uh, people can, can contact me and, and, and have a look at some of the stuff that I've done there. Perfect. Listen, really appreciate your time. Hopefully loads of bits that people can take away from them and uh, hopefully you can catch up again soon. Perfect. Thanks very much, mate. Appreciate it. Thanks for listening to the Sports Initiative podcast with me, Michael Wright. Please remember to follow us on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram at the Sports Initiative podcast and share this podcast with friends and family. I'll see you next week.